Alien invasion movies have been around in the history of cinema for many moons. How many, you might ask? Lots. There are a variety of ways filmmakers have tapped into these little green men coming down from the skies in search of conquest. From the realistic and poignantly themed films like Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. 9 11. The bombastic and very silly action ensemble pieces like Roland Emmerich's Independence Day and the barely comprehensible that gives the audience a very good sense of schadenfreude like Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space. Most of these films don't necessarily have good, well-constructed, and satisfying scripts behind the films. That's no shade on ID4, trust me. Every 4th of July, I recite that brilliant speech that Bill Pullman does to get myself super patriotic. We will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. But if I'm going to deeply delve into an alien invasion film that was both entertaining and worth discussing, I would look no further than one of my absolute favorites, a film that just recently celebrated its 10th birthday. I'm talking, of course, about Attack the Block. In this video, I will be breaking down how first-time writer-director Joe Cornish takes a well-worn genre in science fiction, the alien invasion narrative, and elevates it through the use of a smart script. Now, when I call a script smart, I don't mean intellectual. Die Hard is one of the smartest scripts ever written, and no one would confuse that as highbrow art. My meaning for calling a script smart, I mean that the screenwriter used every trick at his or her disposal to create a cohesive and well-thought-out film, and it doesn't treat the audience like a bunch of toddlers hopped up on ADHD medication. Attack the Block takes its subject matter and turns it into a horror comedy film. The horror genre and the comedy genre, both, are probably the two best genres of film to watch in a crowded theater. The laughs are that much more gut-busting, and the tension is that much more bone-chilling when you're in a room of a hundred or so other people all feeling the same emotions you are. However, neither genre really gets enough recognition for their cinematic cinematic qualities, and they are thought of, for whatever reason, as lesser forms of art. This can be due to quite a few reasons, mainly that horror and comedies are the cheapest forms of film to make, as well as being quite subjective to whichever region creates the film. Not everyone finds the same things funny or scary, so the horror and comedy genres are not seen as prestigious as films that are, for example, the historical epic or Shakespearean-like dramas, or some biopic about some revered person. But the thing is, when done right, the horror-comedy subgenre can elevate both horror and comedy to create something that is more profound. Get Out, which I definitely wouldn't consider a horror comedy, but I guess the Golden Globes think differently, has the character Rod, played by Lil Rel Howery, and he infuses humor into the tense situations that Daniel Kaluuya's Chris finds himself in. That is one way to do horror comedy effectively. You have your horror scenes that build tension up to a boiling point, and then you have a comedy scene that gives the audience a chance to breathe. This form of horror comedy was also used in John Landis's An American Werewolf in London. David finds himself in very tense and serious situations where he has visions of Nazi werewolves mowing down people with Tommy guns, and then he talks to his undead friend who's kill yourself. Kind of a dick about it. But then there's the Shaun of the Dead model of horror comedy, which uses comedic characters in a straight horror situation. The film delves deeper into themes of friendship, responsibility, and general slacker attitude better than most films that were just trying to be about that. Seriously minded art pieces. And the scene when, spoilers for Shaun of the Dead, 
His mother's bitten, and Sean emotionally argues with David as to what to do. Literally no other zombie movie makes me more empathetic to a character in that situation than Shaun of the Dead does. Attack the Block uses its horror comedy premise to make the audience fully behind a band of heroes who at first come across as people that general audiences probably wouldn't want to get behind. The protagonist is Moses, played by John Buyega in his first feature film role, and he and his band of friends open the film masked and armed with a knife, robbing future Doctor Who, people tell me that's popular, Jodie Whittaker's Samantha. However, the film uses its point of view in this opening sequence to slowly transition the audience to follow our protagonists. We start the sequence following Sam. She is leaving the London Underground on the phone and walking home when she finds herself cornered by five young assailants. The image of a woman walking home at night builds the tension. By the time she realizes that she's in a bad situation, it's too late. But after something falls from the sky and crashes into a nearby car, Sam uses that as an opportunity to get away. But instead of following her, we cut back to the assailants who lower their masks to show the face of young teenagers. Moses decides to use the opportunity of a open car to go try and steal something from the glove box. But instead of finding some cash in the glove box or something he could pawn or steal, he finds what the kids poetically call a big gorilla wolf motherfucker or as nick frost puts it maybe there was a party at the zoo and a monkey fucked a fish it scratches moses and then runs off into the park the boys chase it through the park and find it cornered in a shack moses decides puffing out his chest that it's his and he's going to kill it only a moment into their struggle moses begs for his friends to come in and help him his boisterousness and braggadocious bravado is undercut in a moment of fear which allows us to find humor in the horror situations they kill it mounted on a stick and prayed it all the way through their apartment up to the penthouse suite which is Ron's weed room. What's Ron's weed room? It's a big room full of weed and it's Ron's. Using it as a way to store it because they think they can make money off of what Nick Frost's Ron describes as a species hitherto unknown to science, quite possibly non-terrestrial in origin. Unbeknownst to them, they only killed a smaller, much more manageable invader and a cluster of bigger and badder boys are coming down from the sky. Since I want this video to be on the shorter side, generally speaking, instead of going through the plot, I'm going to specifically be talking about the ways the script elevates the genre by using simple but effective screenwriting tricks to show why this film is fantastic. The first topic I'd like to talk about is the conciseness of the script. Clocking in at just under 90 minutes, there is zero fat on this baby. Every character serves a purpose, and every scene adds to the plot or character or moves the conflict forward. We meet the girls right after the boys kill that first alien. That's whose room they hide in at the midpoint of the movie when they're being hunted. We meet the stoner Brewis, played by Luke Treadaway or not Dr. Frankenstein from Penny Dreadful. He seems to be just a funny, haha, I'm so stoned character. He's the one who comes up with the pheromones angle of the movie. We see that Nick Frost's Ron is working for Hi-Hats, played by Jumaine Hunter. Hi-Hats ambushes them in Ron's weed room, which is his weed room, at the third act turning point of the film, adding even further conflict into a very dire situation. There's a technique in screenwriting and in all narrative storytelling, to be honest, called the plant and payoff. Very briefly, it is the idea that if you want something important to happen in your film, you want to set it up earlier so that the audience can be satisfied by it. They can be like, oh, I remember that. Very clever of you, writer. And it is very clever. It's introducing important details into the story earlier so they can be shown later and utilized to their potential. This can be seen to be used in many different ways. In comedy, there's the plant, somebody drops a banana peel onto the ground, and then the payoff, somebody slips on the banana peel and falls. Chekhov's gun, a playwriting rule, states that if a gun is shown in act one, it has to go off by act three. And that is a further highbrow example of the planting and payoffing. 
Even the master of cinema, Alfred Hitchcock himself, showed his use of planting and payoff in his example of how to use suspense effectively. He stated, Let's suppose there is a bomb underneath the table between us. Nothing happens, and then all of a sudden, boom, there is an explosion. The public is surprised, but prior to this surprise, it has been an absolutely ordinary scene of no special consequence. Now it will take a suspense situation. The bomb is underneath the table and the public knows it, probably because they've seen an anarchist place it there. The public is aware the bomb will explode at one o'clock and there is a clock in the decor. The public can see that it is a quarter to one. In these conditions, the same innocuous conversation becomes fascinating because the public is participating in the scene. The audience is longing to warn the characters on the screen. You shouldn't be talking about such trivial matters. There is a bomb beneath you and it is about to explode. <sighs> So much cheese. It's simple. But if a film has plants and payoffs, you can tell that the script was in good hands and that everything that happens in the film was meticulously planned out to satisfy you, the audience. And Attack the Block has as many plants and payoffs as there is alien invaders that attack the block. And Cornish uses them for everything from plot developments to character interactions, to joke line callbacks that have different contexts in each iteration. So I'm about to go through a whole list of them, all right? One, when they go through Sam's purse, they find out that she's a nurse, leading to them getting to her apartment and saying, you're a nurse, help our friend who has been bitten by one of the aliens. Two, when they're walking home from killing the first alien, Biggs walks to a ledge and sees another ledge on the other side, saying that he can jump it, but he doesn't, scared. This gets paid off when they're chased by the aliens and he gets cornered, forcing the only way out is to jump to the other ledge, which he does. Three, when Bruis arrives at the block, he's waiting at an elevator. The boys brush past him, get in the elevator, make it full, and he says, I, I get the next one. Later, when he's waiting for an elevator and it opens up to a bunch of gore and carnage, Hi-Hat's standing there. Hi-Hat's walks past him and says, Better get the next one. Sticking with Bruce for four, we see his car get demolished as the kids are robbing Jody Whittaker's Sam. So that when he gets back, walks down the street, goes to his car, it's demolished, he's stuck there. Him being stuck there allows for a further contribution. That contribution is five when he's really high in Ron's weed room watching TV. It's a nature documentary talking about how female moths use pheromones to lead male moths to a different area where they can thrive, which is exactly how these aliens function, and Bruis is the one to realize it on an interstellar scale. Six, Dennis steals a gun from Probs and Mayhem, saying that this isn't a toy. When he fires it, it's a cap gun. He says, this is a toy. Seven, Probs and Mayhem saying that there isn't water in this gun. Later on, reeling at something flammable and they light an alien on fire. Eight, and kind of the biggest, Samantha's character arc. Planting bringing the cops into the area to arrest those who stole from her. Sarcastically calling them my fucking hero after they say that they saved her from the aliens. To, at the end of the film, telling the police that they saved her and that they are her neighbors. Cornish gives us all we need to know about these boys in regards to their backstory and exposition as to who they are, apart from Moses, in the break into act two, in a masterclass on how to deliver exposition to audience members. When they see the aliens raining down from the skies, and they gleefully say it's raining golems, 
they go home to arm up and defend Earth. Or at least, the ends. The first one to get to his apartment is Jerome. He bursts past his sister and grabs a machete and then runs out, ignoring his sister's protest, saying that she has exams tomorrow and complaining that he's kind of an asshole. It's not much, but we get a little bit of characterization showing his relation to his older sister, at least. Then we follow Biggs, who gets a chain from underneath his sink and lies to his mother, saying that he has to repair his bike. We get a brief moment where it shows the two of them having an interaction showing genuine love and care, and while he is lying to her, he doesn't want to disappoint her. Then we follow Pest, who goes into his apartment, who lives with his grandmother, who seems to be kind of aloof, but a grandmother. He grabs a baseball bat and fireworks and walks out the door. His grandmother says, half-heartedly, now don't you go getting into trouble. Then we follow Dennis, who grabs his biggest katana. He tries to escape the apartment before his dad catches him, but his dad yells out where he's going. He simply replies, out. There's a bit of a yelling match where the dad forces him to take his dog out. Now these bite-sized glimpses into their home lives is a brilliant way to show backstory and character exposition. These interactions gives the audience exactly what they need to know how they interact in their day-to-day -day lives. It's a much more exciting way to get this information to the audience rather than just being told He's the one who likes his mom. He's the one who's kind of alone with the grandparent. It's much better to show, not tell. I skip Moses because in the same sequence, we follow Moses to his door and then we cut away. I'll be honest, the first time I saw this movie, I was like, I didn't think much of it because I was a stupid person who didn't really know movies. But also it was like, yeah, who cares? Let's get on to the aliens. However, later in the film, we get to see Moses' room and apartment through Samantha's eyes. Samantha, who has been robbed by these boys and forced into their adventure, terror, by pure happenstance. She sees Moses as the leader of this group, the oldest, the most mature. Honestly, the audience kind of sees him as, if not an adult, but an older teenager. And throughout the film, we've seen him cool and collected under pressure. We see him get promoted by hi-hats to deal coke now, so he has responsibilities. However, in the third act, just as we're about to get to the climax of the film, Samantha goes into his apartment to set a trap for the aliens. We find he lives with his uncle, who comes and goes. Goes mostly. His apartment is covered in old pizza boxes and takeout containers, and garbage is just completely strewn across this unkempt living room. She makes her way to his bedroom and sees that he sleeps with a Spider-Man comforter. She then goes and asks how old he is, and he says 15. This revelation changes the entire context of who this character has been up until this point. He's just a kid, and while he puts on this grown-up, tough-guy attitude because the world has made him do it. He finds comfort in things that all 15-year-olds feel comfort in, namely comic book heroes and pizza. Anybody say, cowabunga, dude? No, but it's seriously pretty sad. The theme of monsters are throughout this movie. What? An alien invasion movie about monstrous aliens attacking Earth it has a theme about monsters? That's some top-the-line film criticism there, isn't it, you fucking hack. But, okay, fine. It's not just the alien invasion. It's further explored throughout the film as a whole. After they rob Samantha, she's taken in by a kindly neighbor. They commiserate together, saying that they are fucking monsters. Yeah. Fucking monsters. After the aliens have been wiped out, Pest, Bruis, and Ron are walking through the smoke-filled hallways. They hear noises coming towards them. Bruis, scared, wonders if it's more monsters coming. Pest says sort of, and as if on cue, police officers with their guns trained at them say armed police and force them to the ground. And the last shots of the movie are Moses, a scared 15-year-old boy who has just saved the day from some sort of alien invasion, having to reckon with an entire armed squad of police who 
who find him in an elevator that is covered with blood and gore. And as he's hauled off in cuffs, Samantha tells the police, who are only in the area because of her, another plant and payoff, not because of the invasion, because she went to the police and told them of the mugging. The authorities don't really seem to give a shit about the invasion, to be honest. She says that Moses is a hero. So yeah, monsters and biases. Ooh, this film is deep. Yeah, maybe. The only truly monstrous character is Hi-Hats, and he's got some pretty dope beats. Don't give a fuck. <laughs> and is kind of sort of stupid. He does get himself essentially turned into Lon Chaney's version of the Phantom of the Opera by the end, because he won't hear sense, as well as having the muzzle discipline of the cop from Plan 9 from Outer Space. Look, I love this movie, so I don't want to spoil the best thrills and the best lines of the film. This is a fantastic movie with a soundtrack that employs brass instruments, John Carpenter type synth, and hip hop all together in the theme. And the creature design of the aliens are so great. Pitch black fur with glowing blue fangs? Mm. Give me that. So good. And there's a sequel in the works. I have no idea what they're gonna do, because it seems like the story has been told, but you've got Joe Cornish coming back, and you've got John Boyega coming back, so he no longer has to deal with the mouse. I am definitely in for that. So do yourself a favor and get in your car and drive it like it's a stolen police vehicle and you're driving away from a bunch of aliens to your local Hollywood video. Yes, I know that Hollywood video was defunct before this movie even came about. And get yourself a copy of this. Or rent it on Amazon. I don't know. What do the kids do these days? TikTok it. All praise to Space Lord Bezos. And before you do, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. And uh, there was a plant. So here's the payoff. I planted it. I had to pay it off. I don't want this. Please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Press the bell. Ring the bell. Whatever. I don't know.